Okay, good morning everyone. We are continuing here in the Yud Gimel Ikrim, in the 13 Principles of Faith. And we find ourselves holding by principle number 5. And the fifth principle over here, as we began mentioning last week, is Ani Ma'amin Be'emuna Shalema, which is that I believe Be'emuna Shalema with complete faith. That the only place that I should direct all of my prayers, where I should pour out my heart, speak what's on my mind and ask for what I need, is only to the Rebbeinu Shalom to Hashem. And it's not fitting to daven to anyone else. Not to think that perhaps there are angels out there that you should daven to. Not to think that there are other powers in the universe that we should spend our time in our prayers. Rather, a person is going to daven only to our Kaddish Baruch. And we began speaking about last week this idea that Hashem has given us the power of prayer because He wants us to be able to connect to Him. As we mentioned that the nature of our creation is that we have inside of ourselves a chelik elokam yima, we have a peace of Hashem. And that peace of the Rebbein Hashem, which we call the Tzelem Elohim, the godliness inside of us, is always striving to get back to where it comes from. And where does it, der- where does it emanate from? It comes from Hashem Himself. And therefore, through our prayers, through the Shmon Esrei, which, as the Ramchal teaches us, Hashem put into perfect order exactly the recipe, exactly the instructions how to get to Hashem. So through all of our davening, through all of our prayers, everything that we do, it's going to allow the nature of who we are to return, to return to sender, so to speak, to return to the Creator Himself. Now I want to speak about something today which is, in those of us that are, have been learning together for years, we've spoken about this many times. Those that are joining us now, we want to speak about a very a very central, a central issue or a central topic in our prayers, why it is that prayer is the way that it is. The Gemara tells us that the Imahis, that the matriarchs of Klal Yisrael, Sarah, Rivka, and Rachel, Leah was not, but the three of them, Sarah, Rivka, and Rachel, they were all barren. And they all struggled with fertility issues and they did not have children immediately in their marriages. And the Gemara asks, why would Hashem do such a thing? These are the future mothers of Klal Yisrael. These are the women that are going to, their children are going to be the link in the chain of all of our history. All of us that are living here today as part of Klal Yisrael, we are members of the family that stems all the way back to Avram. And Avram and Sarah had a child whose name was Yitzchak, and Yitzchak had a son whose name was Yaakov, and Yaakov had 12 sons, and those 12 sons are the children that we are all, so we stem from one of them. So the HaKadosh Baruch wants the Jewish people to be built, and He wants us to procreate, and He wants us to be fruitful and to multiply and to give off our destiny and our generations of, of lineage. So then why would Hashem make it so difficult for our, for our matriarchs that they did not have children right away? If, if that's what Hashem wants, the continuity of Klal Yusuf, it should have come like that. And of course, we are familiar with the famous words in the Gemara that tells us, tells us that HaKadosh Baruch was mis'ave l'tfilas and shal tzadikim. Hashem, He desires the tefillah, the prayer of tzadikim, of the righteous. Now, what does that mean? Because that HaKadosh Baruch has some sadistic desire that he likes to see the righteous people daven, so therefore he makes their lives miserable and doesn't give them children. Since that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he, he sits around upstairs in the heavens all day long looking, he, it's not like us during coronavirus where we go into the fridge to see what can we eat. Is it ice cream, a candy bar, a piece of pizza. HaKadosh Baruch is sitting up in the heavens and he's hungry, he's got a desire as a taiva, and so he's looking around, what's he going to be able to, uh, to pick out today? He says, you know, what I, you know what I desire? 
not a Snickers bar, not a desire pizza with all the trimmings on it. I desire tefillah, I like the prayers of tzaddikim. But how do I get a tzaddik to daven? Okay, he's going to daven Shemar Esrei, that's very nice. He'll open up his Sefer Tehillim, very nice. But how do I get really hard-earned prayers out of the tzaddikim? He says, Hashem, you know what I need to do? i got to press down on them, and I have to make things a little bit hard. And if I will squeeze them out with sorrows, with difficulties, and I will not give them what they want to have, and I'll, and I'll make their lives with a little bit of misery, and a little bit of suffering, and sometimes even a lot of challenges in their life, then they'll realize they have no other place to turn besides me, and then my desires will be satisfied because it's music to my ears to hear the tzaddikim, to hear the righteous people of the generation daven. Are we so silly? Is that a Kodesh Baruch who plays like a wicked game with his tzaddikim? He damages their lives and he puts them into perilous situations just because he gets his kicks by hearing our tefillahs? What is Chazal, what are Chazal teaching us over here that Hashem is mis'avil the tefillahs and shal tzaddikim? He desires the tefillah, the prayers of the tzaddikim of the righteous. What does that mean? So I'd like to take two approaches and I think that they're similar, they're related to each other. But I'll start with the Maharal. The Maharal writes over here on these words, the following. And he says that Hashem, yes, is mis'av, he desires the prayers of tzaddikim. Why? Shi'abracha ve'ashpa mikol tzad. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring down the brach, he wants to bring down the blessing on all sides. Ki yoisem eshatino groitzer linoik more than a child wants to nurse from the mother, the mother wants to give forth her milk to the child. Now, then, again, any mother that is, has nursed before knows there's a certain point that if the baby's not nursing, it's painful for the mother not to be able to release the milk into the baby's mouth. A mother is uncomfortable. A mother doesn't feel good. She has this milk that HaKadosh Baruch has given her to sustain her child, and she wants nothing more than to be able to share that with this child who is hungry and is looking for the milk. And if he, he doesn't, if the child is he's not feeling well that day, or he's listless, or he's not latching on in the right way, so the mother simply is not able to give over the milk that she wants to. So she does everything in her abilities to arouse this child to become, a, to become hungry and thirsty and to drink the milk, the, the God-given nutrients that HaKadosh Baruch has implanted inside of her. Says the Maharal, more than the child wants to milk, the mother is the one who just wants to give and to give and to give and to give. More than we want HaKadosh Baruch Hu's brachas, more than we want His abundance, more than we want His goodness, more than we want the, the happiness in our lives which is going to stem and emanate from Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch has a very strong desire to give that over to us. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to have all of our needs. He wants us to be satisfied in the way in which He's running our lives. He wants us to have all of that. Says the Maharal, there's only one way that Hashem can truly fulfill the brachas and the goodness that He wants to shower down on this world. Ubliat fila without prayer. V'abracha enu yocha la'ashpia ba'aylam. Hashem, so to speak, is not able to allow His blessing to be mashpia, to have a positive impact here on this world. Which means, as the Maral is explaining, it's not that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has these wicked games, God forbid that He's playing up in the heavens, and that we're just like a, some kind of uh, uh, computer game or some kind of video game that's going on down here in this world where Hashem is just choosing, who am I going to afflict today because I'll get more prayers out of Him? Whose life I'm going to make miserable, I'll get more prayers out of Him? It doesn't work like that. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to bring so much goodness down into this world. But there's a caveat. And the caveat is, 
We need to be the ones that are going to help to bring the bracha into this world. How do we do that? Says the Gemara one way, tefillah, our prayers. And sometimes Hashem wants to give and give and give and give, but He can't. So He needs to press us down in this world to allow us to recognize the source of all of the bracha, the source of all of the goodness, the source of all of the health, the source of all of the success. It's all coming from Hashem. And the reason that He's holding things back from me right now is because He wants me to call out to Him in prayer and ask Him, please, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you who are the source of everything that it all emanates from you, bring it down into this world right now. And therefore the Imahais, the matriarchs, whose prayers were so powerful, whose neshamas were so lofty and so great, he would often afflict them, he would often turn off the reproductive glands of that woman in order that she would say, if I'm going to have a child, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it is all up to you. And she would daven and daven and daven and pray and pray and pray and pray in order that it should take place. <clears throat> says, the, says the Gemara, and the way the Maral is explaining it over here, yes, Hashem has a taivi, He desires our prayers. But it's not a selfish desire in which He desires our prayers. It's not like He walked into the ice cream shop and He has to try all 39 flavors because He has a desire for ice cream. It's not like He's looking around on Amazon to see all the different whims and desires that he could fulfill by the things that he wants to order today. That's not how Hashem works. Chas v'shalom to say such a thing. But rather what it means is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself wants that he can bring down all of the brach into this world because he cares about us. He desires to see us happy. He desires to see us satisfied. To see all of our needs taken care of. He wants that. But we have to do our part in the, in the program over here. And that is we have to be deserving of all of the brachas that are going to come down into this world. What is one of the ways that we do that? We activate the pipes of blessing by pouring out our hearts in brach and prayer before Hashem. I, what if a person not davening enough? What if a person doesn't spend enough time every single day concentrating on the words of Shema Nesrei? They don't say to heal them with fervor and with their hearts. They just read it like this. What if a person not doing enough? He says, Hashem, I'm going to squeeze the prayers out of you. Not for me. It's not my benefit. It's for your benefit. More than the mother. The mother's not nursing because of her own personal selfish benefit. She's nursing because she wants that child to be healthy. You know that the doctors, the scientists have gone through all of the quality in mother's milk and they have found that there is nothing, there is no greater food that a child can be raised on than the milk of the mother, the nutrients, the antibodies, the, the, the antibacterias that are in there, the, the proteins, everything that a child could possibly need to make it healthy and strong, it's all in the milk. The mother's milking for herself. She's milking because she wants that child to have all of the health and the nutrients and the stamina and to be able to grow and, be, and ward off viruses and bacteria and the germs and everything in the world. So she gives to that child. In the middle of the night, she doesn't crack, she doesn't complain. In the middle of the night when the baby starts crying his head off at 3 a.m. and you're exhausted, you think to yourself, but this is exactly what the baby needs right now. He needs some more nutrients and more protein and more carbohydrates and more anti... He needs it all. There's like natural antibiotics inside of the mother's milk. So she can turn a moment of frustration into a moment of glory because she says, look what Hashem has given me to be able to do, give over to my child. Says HaKadosh Baruch I don't want to give you blessing because I get excited when I give you blessings. I get excited to give you blessings because it's good for you. Because you want what's, what is coming to you. You want betterness. You want great, great things to happen in your life. You want the blessing. You don't want what you feel is the curses that sometimes HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends your way. But I can only give it to you if you cry out to me, says Hashem. That's the way that I built the world. You need to earn 
the brach in your life. You need to earn the goodness in your life. There's a world of hishtad, there's a world of effort. The efforts that you have to make is prayer. Now it's not such effort. It's natural to open your mouth and call out to Hashem. As we know the famous Mishnah that teaches us there was an animal on the, on the, on the banks of the, of the sea that looked to be somewhat of, I guess it sounds like from the, from the Mishnah, somewhat of a walrus. And the sages wanted to know, is this walrus, is it a land animal or is it a sea animal? And they didn't know how to determine. They would see it sometimes in the ocean, sometimes they would see it on the sand. They weren't sure. And over there in the mission has practical differences whether it belongs to the, to the ocean or belongs to the land. So they said, what are we going to do? So we have a great idea. Let's scare the animal. And wherever the animal will run when it is scared, we'll know that's the source of its existence. So they ran over to this big walrus and they screamed at the animal, they started running after it, and where did it run? It ran straight back into the ocean. Say Chazal, our citations teach us that's the same thing with a human being. We don't know exactly where we are directing all of ourselves to all day long. What is our avoider? What is our service of God? What do we recognize in this world where the source of everything is going to come from? Nevertheless, when we recognize that it's all coming from the Rebbeinah Shailam, when we are squeezed and we are pressed, what do we do? We open our mouths and we turn to Hashem. As it says, there are no atheists in the foxhole. Why? Because when a person is in that moment of truth and they realize there is nowhere to run, there is nowhere to hide, there is nowhere to turn, where do you turn? Naturally. You open your heart and you open your lips and you turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm going to squeeze you a little bit. And if I squeeze you under pressure, which means that whatever it is that a person will feel that they are lacking in their lives, they should take that as a message. That's where Hashem wants your prayers. Not just simple prayers. He wants serious tefillah. Because he's Miss Avi, he desires that because when he hears it, then he can send you the brachas that you want and that you're asking for. There's a story that I saw many, many years ago. There was a, a woman and her husband, they were barren for years, childless. And they went to all of the great sages in America, in Eretz Israel. They asked for their brachas to no avail. They went to the doctors, they went through treatments, they went through all fertility experts, no avail. They decided one day that they would take a visit from America to Eretz Yisrael, and they would do the last amount of ishtalus of efforts, and they would go and they would pray in all of the holy, holy places of, of Israel, and they would beseech, and they would pour out their heart to Hashem, and they would ask Him, please, Open up the womb, let us have a child. And they were on the last leg of their journey in the Holy Land. And they just had not connected with prayers the way that they were hoping they were going to. And as they were only one or two days before their departure to America, they began to feel that it just maybe it wasn't meant to be. And last stop on the prayer destination was Keva Rachel, was the grave of our matriarch, Rachel Imenu. And Rachel is known as the one whose grave is along the side of where the Jewish people will travel into exile, out of exile. And she will always be mevaka, but now she will always be crying for her children. And one of the holiest places of prayer that a Jew could go to in the world is there by the cave or by the graveside of Rachel Imenu. There's a certain power of tefillah that emanates from that place. It's something that when a person will connect to it, it's like no other prayer they ever felt in their entire life. And so the husband and the wife take a bus and they go to the graveside of Rachel Imenu. And as they're getting off the bus, they said, okay, the next bus is coming in 35 minutes. Let's meet back here 35 minutes later. And the wife and the husband depart their ways into the men's section, the women's section, and they go to Davin. 
And the woman comes in, she stands by the cave or by the grave of Rachel Imenu, she begins davening, she starts talking, and she starts talking to Hashem. And still the words are not coming, the emotions are not in the heart, the tears are not flowing. She looks at her watch and she sees it's 28 minutes already. She soon has to leave. And at that moment, this woman begins to pour out her heart in prayer like she never, ever davened before. And she starts going back in her life when she was a young girl in Beis Yaakov, all of the drushes, all the schmoozing that she heard about the power of prayer. How she was a seminary girl in Eretz Yisrael and she davened by the Kaisel and she davened by the grave of Rachel and she went to all different places and she believed in the power of prayer. And then she begins to talk to Hashem and she begins explaining how painful the last 15 years of her life have been, childless, her sisters are married, even the younger ones, with children. She's going to the bar mitzvahs of her nephews, all of her friends from school. They all have children that are making bar mitzvahs as well. And here she is, her and her husband. They're just asking one child, Hashem. And she starts crying her eyes out like never, ever before. And the first bus drove away. And she doesn't stop davening. Another 35 minutes, the second bus drives away. And she cannot unlock herself from the world of prayer. And she's pouring out her She's talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Please Hashem, please Hashem, give us a child. And another 35 minutes, and the third bus drives away. And finally she feels as if she's squeezed out every last prayer that she has inside of her. And with tears still in her eyes, her face beat red from all the tears that have fallen on there, puffy eyes, she walks outside and she sees her husband standing and waiting for her. And instead of asking her, oh, where were you? We're supposed to... He sees her face and it tells the entire story. His wife just poured out her heart and gave the tefillah, gave the prayers that Hashem is misavah that he desires. And they came back to America and within one year they had their first child. A couple of years later they had their second child. And a couple of years after that they had their third and their final child. And this woman said, after the third child was born, it's no coincidence that HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewarded us with three children for those prayers. Because I dove in so hard. I went through three buses that were supposed to take us back from Keva Rachel. I missed all three because of the heartfelt prayers that I was pouring out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the meter connected meter, the measure for measure is, I did my job down here in this world and just let go. And I poured out my heart like water. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, one, two, three, hour and a half, two hours of davening, I'm going to give you your children that you're asking for. Even more than you're asking for. He strongly desires the prayers of the righteous because we activate in the heavens. We do our ishtalis, our efforts down here, and it brings down the brach, it brings down the blessings that Hashem would like to give us. And perhaps one other idea that we can say is that Hashem, and it's very closely related, but Hashem would like to fill up the world with kvayit shemaim, with the glory of heaven. He would like His shechina to be everywhere so that any single person who looks out into the world, they will be able to sense in a palpable way the shechina, that it exists, the divine presence. That a person will go through life and at every corner they take, oh, there's Hashem, there's Hashem, here He is in my life, that's HaKadosh Baruch in my life. 
But Hashem says in a similar vein, if you want the world to be filled with Kvayit Shemayim, with the glory of the Shekhinah, with the glory of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's essence, you are the one that needs to bring it down into this universe. We do it with our mitzvahs, we do it with the Torah that we learn, we do it with our acts of chesed, and Chazal are teaching us there's one area that is so special when it comes to bringing down Hashem's glory to fill up the universe. And that is tefillah, that is our prayers. So what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, He has to activate, He has to push us to be able to daven in the right way because we don't always get the picture. Yes, Baruch Hashem, we daven every day and we say our Shmon Esrei and we bow down in humility, it's true. And when somebody is sick, we get on the Tehillim chat or the Tehillim list and we say Tehillim, it's all true, we do all of that. But Hashem says it could be more. A person can always push themselves and do more in the world of prayer. So sometimes I have no choice, says Hashem. I must press you down and squeeze you to get the words to come out of your mouth where you will recognize I am the source of everything that is coming to this world. And then I will bring down the bounty of divine influence into your life and the lives of everyone that is around you. With all of the painful loss and death which has taken place during the last three months of this coronavirus, with all of the numerous tzaddikim that have been taken from this world, and the yisayimim, the orphans, and the almanais, and the widows that are left over in this world right now, and all of the tragedies that are still going in the hospital as we speak, people that they don't know if their husband is going to make it out of there alive, or if a child, now there's some bizarre thing going on with the children that they seem also been affected by the COVID virus over here, and they're getting unusual ailments, death, deathly ill. One thing has been produced over all of these months, and that is that the Jewish people have picked up their level of tefillah, their level of prayer. Because with all of the Tehillim that have been said, all of us that have tried and we have felt bad and we have felt pain and we daven for our loved ones and we daven for the people, the acquaintances and even the people that we don't know. HaKadosh Baruch is squeezing out the tefillos and shel tzaddikim. He's squeezing out the prayers of the righteous. And our tefillah to HaKadosh Baruch is that it's enough Hashem. Enough people have been lost from this world. Enough families have been torn apart. Enough children don't even have fathers, or even mothers that are going to raise them anymore. So please find that our prayers have been successful and they've been enough already in this world that we have satisfied your taiva, your craving to be able to bring down more kvot shemai, more of the glory of the shechina here into this world. And if we dive in with our hearts, and we dive in with our souls, and we dive in with understanding of what we are saying over here, then yes, HaKadosh Baruch Himself will listen, and He will pay attention, and He will recognize that we ourselves down here in this world have realized it's all the Rebbein Sha'ilam. Dr. Fauci will tell us everything that he wants to tell us. At the end of the day, when it's going to go away, it's because of Hashem. The president can lift restrictions, he can put on restrictions, he can make comments, he cannot make comments. At the end of the day, Hashem brought it on and Hashem will take it away. And all of the rules and regulations that we follow to try to stay safe and save lives and be so considerate of the spreading of germs to make sure that we don't halila infect another person. So all of that is good and we have to do our efforts in this world. But at the end of the day, you are Kodesh Baruch You are the one that is going to decide to wipe the germs away from this world so that we can begin to go back to some kind of normal life and behave like, like, an, like a normal human being once again. And if we will daven, and we will pray, and we will express our words in the ways that is so beautiful and so meaningful to Hashem, 
and we will ask him that Rachmanis have mercy on this world, then HaKadosh Baruch says, I cannot turn away your prayers because you are satisfying my desires to fill up the world with more kvot shemayim, with more honor of the Shechina, of the Divine Presence, to make my name known throughout the world that people will recognize me and they will see me and they will live their lives accordingly. There's a beautiful Maisa which took place maybe, I believe it's over 15 years ago already. There was a young boy in B'nai Brak, in Eretz Yisrael, his name was Cheski, sweet, nine-year-old boy, happy-go-lucky, pure as could be, running around the streets of B'nai Brak, running in the schools with his little payas bouncing up and down on his head over there, the picture of purity. But one day he noticed that he was getting a headache, and he went to school that day and he just couldn't play with all the kids. The next day his headache was getting worse, and he was having a very hard time concentrating and paying attention to his Rebbe in class. And a few days later, he told his parents, I'm not sure what's going on, but I have a headache and my eyesight is getting blurry. I don't know what's happening. His parents, as you can imagine, were a little bit concerned. They've heard about these stories before. And they called the doctor. They said, our son is not feeling well and they brought him in for an appointment for a checkup. The doctor asked little Chesky a bunch of questions, and he began running the battery of tests on this little boy. And unfortunately, as the parents and Chesky were called back to the doctor a few days later for the results, the results were not good. Unfortunately, the doctor looked at them and they told them that they were convinced that there was a cancerous tumor that was in the brain and it would require enormous amounts of chemotherapy and treatments and maybe even surgery at one point to remove it and that a long road of recovery that would be fraught or wrought with difficulties ahead of them. And as Chesky's parents were listening to everything that the doctor said to them, they began to become emotional. Tears were forming in their eyes. And little Chesky didn't understand everything. And as the doctor got up and he left the room, the father looks at his son, holding him tightly, and he begins explaining to Chesky everything that the doctor has just said. Cancer brain tumor, chemotherapy, treatments, pain, he's going to lose weight, his body will, re, will, will be racked in suffering. And the little boy is looking at his parents wide-eyed, trying to take everything in. And he said, Cheske, I want you to know that one of the things that will happen to you as well, so you shouldn't be alarmed and scared, all of your hair is going to fall out from the chemotherapy. And by this time, the parents are crying. And Chesky is sitting there somewhat emotionally at, emotionless at this point. And at the end of their schmooze, of their talk together, Chesky asks, can he go into the other room by himself? He just needs to think about things. And he goes into the other room, and the parents are watching through the window, and they see Chesky walk over to the window, and they're listening ever so slightly to what he says. And Chesky begins talking, as if he's talking to a dear friend of his. He's talking to the Rebbein Shalom, and he says the following, he says, Hashem, I want you to know that I accept everything that you are doing is all for the best. And I know that whatever is going to happen to me, it's all for the good. And I'm willing to take all of the pain. But there's one thing that I'm begging you not to do. And at this moment, Chesky begins to cry. And he says, please, Hashem, don't take away my payas. This is what makes me look like a Yid, like a Jew. My parents told me the medicine is going to make all my hair fall out. 
but I'm begging you, Hashem, please, you can let it all fall out. But don't take away the hair from my payas. I want them to stay here, please. And at this moment, this young, pure little boy, nine years old, he's not worried about the pain. He's not worried about the suffering in front of him. He's not worried about all the treatments and the chemotherapy and the possible surgery. He's not worried about that. One thing is paining him. If God forbid he would lose his payas, these curly little brown payas that bobble up and down on his face that make him look like a Jew. And he's, he's sobbing uncontrollably. And his father and mother come into the room and they hold him tight and they just let him cry and they start crying and their tears are inter, intermingled together. Now listen to the story. In the next week, Chesky began his chemotherapy. And it's true, he lost a lot of weight, he was emaciated, he was weakened by everything, he could barely move some days, could barely even talk. And his hair began falling out, one hair after the other. Except miraculously, which nobody could explain. There were two areas on his head where not a single strand of hair fell out. And that was right here. On those beautiful brown little curly payas. That Chesky himself, Davin to HaKadosh Baruch please Hashem, let it all fall out. Pay me, do whatever you want. But don't take away the payas. Because with those, I recognize that's what makes me a Jew. After about four months of chemotherapy, and Chesky was surviving, but very in a lot of pain, they took him to see the great sage of our generation, of Chaim Kanievsky. He wanted to get a bracha that everything should work and he should have Rafu Shlema. And when he walked into Rav Chaim Kanievsky and Rav Chaim saw him, this emaciated boy with no hair but payas, he realized this is a child with cancer. And he asked him, what's the story, my son? He said, what's going on? And he told him the story, how he was diagnosed with the cancer, the brain tumor, everything. And he dove into the Rebbeinu Sha'ilom that Hashem can do anything that He wants, but please, Hashem, don't take away my payas, please. For that is what makes me look like a Jew. Rav Chaim Kanievsky was so nishtoimim, he was so shocked by the way in which this boy looked with the payas hanging out over there. He called in his entire family that was in the house at that time, and he said, look, at the power of the prayers of a young child. He davened for one thing, and a Kodesh Baruch Hu took care of him, and he sent it. Hashem is mis'avil et filos and shal tzaddikim. He desires the prayers of the righteous, and therefore he asks us, when you're going to pray, when you're going to open your mouth in prayer, only one address just to me, says Hashem. Sometimes you don't realize it. Sometimes you forget just how much I'm waiting for your prayers because I want to give you the good. What are you missing in your life, says Hashem? Examine your life. Tell me what you're missing. There is nothing in the world that I cannot do, says Hashem. But you need to ask. And you, you need to ask with great sincerity, with strength of character, with heartfelt feelings. And if you'll do that, Says Hashem, why shouldn't I answer you? I'm I desire the prayers of the righteous, and therefore I would like to give you what it is that you are requesting. Says the Rambam explains that not only is this, this principle of our faith referring to making sure that we dive into Hashem. But we have to make sure that as well we don't dive into the wrong place. And he brings us in as a prohibition or a warning that a person should also guard themselves from Avaidah Zara, from idol worship. Because if I'm not davening to Hashem and I turn my prayers elsewhere besides on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who am I davening to then? That means that I'm shifting my prayers 
to something that is not the Rebbeinu Shalom. I'm directing my prayers and my heartfelt desire and my request, not directly to Hashem, somewhere else. Now the Rambam we know tells us elsewhere that the reason or the beginning of Avodah Zor, of idol worship, started in the, in the generation of Enosh, who was the grandson of Adam Arishon, the first man. And in that generation, the, the people of the world, of course they knew that there's only one God. Adam Arishon, the Zayda, the grandfather, he taught them there was only one God. Shays, Kain, Hevel, they taught them there was only one God. However, they decided that the one God that they have wants them to do a little bit extra and start praising the sun, the moon, the stars, the celestial beings in the sky. That'll be a cover, that'll be an honor to Hashem as well. And what ended up happening? They began to change the rules of service of Hashem and they began directing part of their prayers to heavenly celestial entities in the skies. Says the Rambam, you might think that there's nothing so wrong with that. You might think it's just a careless, a little bit of an error that they made, but they were still saying, of course we believe in God. Of course we're going to serve Hashem. Of course when we're daven, we're daven to Hashem, of course. Says the Rambam, that itself is exactly what the prohibition of the Torah is referring to of Avodah Zara. Avodah Zara does not mean idol worship. Avodah means worship. Zara is strange. Strange worship which is not what HaKadosh Baruch has given us to serve Him. Any time that a person changes the rules which HaKadosh Baruch Hu laid down so succinctly and clearly in his, in his rule book, which is the Torah of course, any time that we don't do and we don't serve Hashem the way that we are supposed to, so now we are guilty of Avaida Zara of worshipping some kind of strange type of worship. And therefore, the Rambam writes that when you change the nature of prayer and you direct your tefillahs, you direct your prayers where they don't belong, away from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that itself is, that itself is treading the waters of Avodah Zarah, of strange service of God. Now, the Nevesh Chaim explains to us why is it that the world went into the downward spiral of Avodah Zarah. What is so terrible? Why would the people do such a thing? They lived in a generation where they were only one generation, two generations behind the first man. That means they're, they're there at the beginning of creation still. The world is still a pristine place. Why did they begin to go into Avodah Zarah? Idol, or not idol worship, but why did they go into strange service of God? Change the rules. And the Nevesh Chaim explains over there, this is how I understand it anyway, that what's going on in the world at this time? The people in the world recognize there's one God. He's the creator of the universe. He is watching over the world. He is intimately involved with everything that is going on. If you need something, you pray to Him. You want something, you ask Him. You see something that's going on in your life that's hard to understand, must be coming from God. Why? I don't know, maybe we'll figure it out, maybe we won't figure it out. But that comes with the following strings attached. That means that the master of the universe who created the world and he created our souls and he's watching over everything that we do, the master of the universe is very well aware of every act, of every action, of every word that we say, of every thought that we have in our head of every mitzvah or every avera, of every sin that we commit. Now that is, a very, that is a very overwhelming way for a person to live here in this world. When you know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is watching everything that you do, there's no escape. There is no escape. That means that a person really has an obligation to be on their best behavior at all times because the consequences could be if we do wrong enough, could be devastating. Now, it seems to be that subconsciously at that moment in history, the people of the world were not so comfortable living with that total awareness of Hashem watching over them. So they made a mistake. 
But that mistake, every time that we make mistakes, we have to realize every time that we make mistakes in the way that we think about HaKadosh Baruch in the spiritual worlds, it's emanating from someplace. There are layers and layers and layers of personal biases that are going on underneath us. There are events that we had in our lives, sometimes traumatic, which cause us to look at the world in a certain way. And if the wrong thing happens, it triggers that trauma, and then we're going to make a decision. It could be the wrong decision, but what we went through in our life is going to cause us to do such a thing. There are people that remind us of other people. And I don't like that other person that you're reminding me of, so I don't like you now either. Why? Because the way the guy, he has the same glasses as my enemy. So now I don't like this person. That's ridiculous. But that's the way that the human psyche, that's the way that the world works. The people in the generation of Enosh, which was the grandson of, of Adam Arisham, subconsciously, they were not fully aware of what was going on, but they, inside of themselves, they felt it's just too much. God is everywhere. He's watching over every single thing that we do. You can't even sneeze without HaKadosh Baruch Hu knowing what you're doing. So it's hard for us to live like that. Very hard to know that we're being held accountable for everything that we do. So whether they were aware of it or they were not aware of it, they made a mistake. And they said, let's just change a little bit the way in which we're going to serve Hashem. Instead of all eyes on Him, let's turn our eyes on the stars also and we'll give them praise and we'll honor them as well. Why? Because probably that's what Hashem wants. A king loves when you honor his ministers, so it must be the ministers of the heavens are the stars and the sun and the moon, so we'll honor them out as well. Hashem will like that. And that, says the Rambam, is Avaydazar, you change the rules on how to serve Hashem. Hashem works in one way, exactly the way that He tells us He works. You can't decide the way that you want Hashem to work. You can't decide, this he should see, that he shouldn't see. When I'm a tzaddik, when I'm doing good, let Hashem see me. When I'm a rasha, when I'm wicked, don't let Hashem see me. When I'm davening b'kavana, you could broadcast me on Zoom all across the world. Everybody will see me there, chuckling away in my, in my house like this. And people will see tears streaming down my eyes. Wonderful prayer. But you know, when I'm sitting there on my phone in the middle of Shemon Esrei, because I just got a text over there that looks pretty, pretty important. Amazon's going to three days late because it's coming from China. Don't show that on Zoom. I don't want anybody to see. Says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's not for you to choose. I made the world, I run the world, and I determine the way that the world is supposed to be run. Those are the, that's the symmetry of creation that I made. And therefore you must recognize that when it comes to your prayers, when it comes to your prayers, one of the most important things to recognize is the world is being run by Ashkach Pratis. I am watching over everything that takes place. And therefore since I see it all, and I know it all, and I'm guiding everything, when you pray, you only pray to me, says Hashem. And therefore the, a big chalik, a big portion of our prayers is to recognize constantly, that just as I look in my life and I see that whatever is taking place, I must be convi with conviction and amuna shleima that it's all the rebbeinah shalom, nothing would happen unless he's the one that's guiding it. Therefore, when I pray, it's a recognition that I show HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I recognize everything is from you, Hashem. And therefore, I'm only going to ask for you to take care of me. Because there's nobody else in the world that watches over me. There's nobody else in the world that cares about me the way that you do. There's no other entity in the heavens that is guiding so carefully, so compassionately, so beautifully and so perfectly my life. And therefore when it's time to daven, when it's time to pray, I will not pin my faith on anything else or anyone else. I will put in all of my concerted efforts into the world of tefillah, into the world of prayer that is just for you, Hashem. And that is the way that our prayers have to be. The Amunas Yisrael and the, the, the faith and the conviction of the Jewish people. We believe with, with complete faith. 
Hashem has not given over the reins to anything else in this world to control it. The moon has no control, the sun has no control, people have no control, the FDA has no control. Nobody has control of anything, only Hashem. They run in this world the way that Hashem has dictated naturally they should. The only one that has a choice of how to run the world is Hashem. The sun cannot wake up in the morning and say, ah, you know what, I just don't feel like being very bright today. Uh, maybe he'll talk to the clouds. Clouds, can you bring some rain? I'm just not in the mood to shine. No, it doesn't work like that. If there is a cloudy day, it's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided it's going to be a cloudy day and that there's going to be rain. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that there's going to be viruses in this world has nothing to do with the scientist that was sitting there in a laboratory in Wuhan, China and he released it out into this world to devastate. HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided. And if they're going to find the vaccine quicker rather than later, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be the one that will decide that mankind has suffered enough already. They humble themselves before him and now he's going to bring a vaccine into the world to save and rescue those of us that Baruch Hashem have not been afflicted and save the lives of those that are struggling for their lives right now. But it's all Hashem. And the more that a person will recognize that everything that is happening is the Rebbe Yenish your prayers are that much more powerful because you begin to believe as we're going to see momentarily, you begin to believe that you found the right address for your prayers and Hashem alone is the only one that is going to take care of things. And these are really the words of the Mesil Sisharim. The Ramchal writes the following, When you are standing in prayer, you have to conjure up and you have to believe and you have to know that you are literally standing in front of Hashem. And you are having a conversation with Hashem. Even though that your eyes, the physical eyes that we have, certainly cannot see Him. Hashem has no body. He has no arm. He has no nose, he has no head, he has nothing. But his essence, his midas, his traits, who he really is, that is right there. It's very, very hard, the Ramchal admits. It is very hard to come up with a creative image of who HaKadosh Baruch Hu is standing there. Because our physical senses seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and, and, uh, and hearing are not involved in the process of recognizing Hashem. Because He's so ethereal, He's so omniscient, He's so spiritual, your physical senses cannot relate. Adam, however, if your mind works well, with a little bit of delving into it and, and meditating upon these ideas, the Simas Lev, and you place your heart onto it to try to get to the core of what we're talking about. You'll be able to affix inside your heart the truth of the matter, which is, I'm standing before the Rebbe Nishal Eilam. How I'm coming and I'm talking to Hashem. And He's taking my words and He's giving back. He's taking, we're having a dialogue over here. I'm standing before Hashem and I am, I am supplicating before Him. And before, from Hashem, I'm asking for everything. And guess what? Hashem has bent His ear down. He's listening to you. He's paying close attention. Just like when you speak to your friend. And your friend listens to you. Says the Ramchal, you know how strong our prayers are? If a person would be able to understand that you are literally standing in front of the Rebbein Nishayim and you are talking to him and he is listening to you. Now again, it takes creativity. It takes imagination. 
It takes deepening your levels and your wellsprings of amuna, of faith that you have. But once that you get to that point, your prayer goes into a new world. You're no longer standing in, in, on earth and you're opening your physical lips and you're just saying the words of prayer. You are literally standing in the heavens at the time of prayer and your lips are just communicating the feelings and the words of your neshama, of your soul, and you are talking directly to the Rebbe Nishayim. We are not zeichu, we, we are not privileged that every prayer that we say is going to be on that level. We just, we say, we can't. We're too physical, we're too earthy, we have too many things on our mind, too many things going on around us, just too much. But this is the goal that we are trying to work towards. We're trying to work towards a goal like the Ramchal says, where I recognize and I, and I see it in, inside of my heart of hearts that I'm literally standing before the Rebbe Nisham. I had a friend in yeshiva many, many years ago. He used to daven every single, every single prayer, I think no less than a 30-minute Shemon Esrei. It's a very, very long time to daven Shemon Esrei. And I asked him once, Shmuel, I said, how do you daven so long? And every time you see him daven, he looks like he's talking with, how do you daven so long? So he said many, many years before when he was, not many, but years before when he was a bacher, he was a, he was a young man learning in Eretz Yisrael in Yeshiva. He had a Rebbe, his name was Rav Meltzer. And I was once zeichet here, once or twice I was zeichet here, a, a drush from this Rav Meltzer. He's a man, he's an oivet Hashem. He serves HaKodesh Baruch. Hashem is right there in front of him. So Rav Meltzer once gave a whole drush, a whole shmooze about davening. And he said, how should we daven? How are we going to make our prayers go up to heaven? How are we going to ensure that HaKadosh Baruch is listening to us? And here's what we have to say. What are we going to do? Should we go through every single word of the Siddur with all the Kabbalistic explanations and say the deepest meanings behind it? Should we spend hours and hours and hours in every single Shmon Esrei to make sure that we said every word exactly where it's supposed to be said? Should we learn many, many books all about the power and the meaning of prayer to inspire us and understand just how powerful our prayers are? What are we supposed to do? So he said, I'm going to give you a simple etza, a simple piece of advice. And if you think like this, your prayers will be transformed. You only have to think one small thought. I'm standing in front of the Abishter. I'm standing in front of Hashem. If every time that you come to David Shemon Esra, you will think to yourself, I'm standing in front of Hashem, you will change the way in which you daven. You're not standing in your living room. You're not standing in your office. You're not even standing in shul. Then when Be'ezda Hashem, the shuls are going to be opened up again. You are standing in front of Hashem wherever you are in the world. Whether you are on an airplane, whether you're in the back seat of your car, whether you're in your bedroom, whether you're by the dining room table, whether you're sitting in the most glorious yeshiva in the world, and everybody's just giving a lip service to Hashem, but you are standing in front of the Rebbe Nishayim. When you're standing in front of Hashem, that is the greatest simcha, that is the greatest joy that you were chosen to have the schos, the merit, to be able to talk to Hashem. Several years ago, I took my son to Eretz Yisrael before his bar mitzvah. And we went one morning to Davin by the Slobodka Yeshiva B'nai Brak. And one of the, one of the Rebbeim who was sitting on the Mizrach Vant in the front of the shul, I believe maybe it was the Mashkiach, I don't really call his name right now. We happened to sit a few rows back, but right in front of him. I didn't know him ever before, I never saw him. But what transpired during that shachis was something I never saw in my life. The man was from beginning till end of the davening, sitting there with a smile on his face, talking words. He looked, you could see him talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he, there was a radiant joy that was emanating from his forehead, from his eyes, from his mouth, from his face. And I could not, you're not supposed to look at other people when you're davening, but I could not take my eyes off of this person. 
because I never saw a person daven like this before. And that's what I realized. That this is a man who appreciates the opportunity to know that when he is praying, he is literally standing in front of Hashem. And just as when you talk to your friend, your friend is listening to you. If he's not too busy with an earbud in his ear, paying attention to somebody else. But just as your friend and you are having a conversation and you're looking at each other and there's a give and there's a take. And you can talk and you can tell him what's on your mind and you can share your thoughts with him. When you are davening and you are praying, you are davening to Hashem who's right here in front of you. And a person who davens like that, it's a different feel, it's a different prayer. I'm not talking to a wall. I'm not talking to an antiquated sitter. I'm talking to the master of the universe who's hanging on every word that I say because he desires my prayers, because he wants to bring me bracha, he wants to take care of my needs. We just have to recognize who in fact we're actually talking to. And if we do, Be'ez Hashem, feel that and recognize that and believe in that and live that, the power of our prayers is going to be transformed to another world. And then don't be surprised if the things that you spent weeks and months and years asking for, don't be surprised if suddenly you see your prayers being answered. Now, Kodesh Baruch Hu look down and see the plight of the world and hear the tfilos, the prayers of his nation that is asking, and really the prayers of the entire universe right now, that are asking for the same thing just for health, just for peace, just for safety, just to wipe away the germs that are infecting the world and infecting the people. And Be'ez HaShem and that Zuchus and that merit, we'll, we won't know from the coronavirus anymore. And all of the personal sufferings and the personal difficulties and the personal yearnings that we all have, that everybody has something that they want, that they feel that they need. If we'll daven like we're standing in front of the Rebbe Nishailam, and we truly believe that he's listening to everything that we say, may we be zeichet to see that our prayers are being not only heard, but Hashem is answering us and fulfilling all of the desires of our heart. Latoiva for the good. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful week. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. You're welcome. Have a good week. You're welcome.